I am going to continue from where uh, Dr. Maya left and I am going to add a few more points uh, just to share some ideas, some perspectives and maybe appeal to uh, both your uh, intelligence as well as your hearts uh, and uh, maybe get your views towards the end. Okay? So uh, let us get uh, right into the topic. Uh, this is the outline and the outline uh, slide will keep uh, repeating as we cover sections. Uh, probably Dr. Maya might do more justice to this, but I'll let me just repeat what you probably already know is that uh, in nature we have uh, many interactions. There are the various segments of nature and uh, within each segment we have interactions. For example, within the atmosphere there is a lot of chemistry that happens, a lot of material flows that are happening. Uh, but the atmosphere is again interacting with the hydrosphere and uh, the hydrosphere is interacting with say the lithosphere and so on and so forth. There are um, interactions within each of the segments of the environment and there are interactions uh, across the segments. So um, you, may, you may wonder you know, why so many interactions uh, are there and uh, it actually works out in our favor. It is observing such an interacting uh, dynamic process that uh, one uh, scientist by name uh, James Lovelock. How many of you have heard of James Lovelock? Okay, what do you know about him? Okay, wonderful. So you teach about the Gaia theory. Really? Okay. How many have heard about the Gaia theory? Maybe you have not heard of James Lovelock. Okay. Let me tell you in brief the Gaia theory. Uh, so what James Lovelock, uh, he was an atmospheric uh, scientist and he was working for NASA. There is actually, by the way, you could note it down uh, for want of time, I am not showing you a video. There is a video on YouTube called uh, Gaia the Sacred Balance. Okay, it is just a 3-4 minute or maybe 2-3 minute video. Uh, which will uh, kind of explain his perspective. So he was working with NASA and uh, in order to find signs of life on different planets. Now you can't go to the planets to, to see whether there is life or not. Okay? But what you have is you have spectroscopic information. So how looking at the, the, the atmospheres from spectroscopic uh, information you can infer what is the composition of the various planetary atmospheres and how do you infer from the planetary atmospheres whether life exists on that planet or not. So as he was studying he actually contrasted uh, you know for example uh, the, the atmosphere of Venus and the atmosphere of the earth. Now, um, the earth has so much of oxygen. Now, that oxygen uh, for the elemental distribution in earth, the oxygen, so much of free oxygen is probably not the lowest energy state. It is better off for that oxygen to oxidize the carbon and maybe some minerals and things like that. And the uh, atmosphere of the earth should have been more like Venus. Okay, Venus, you know, is a runaway greenhouse effect. Okay, very thick atmosphere. You have lots of uh, CO2 and uh, things like that. So anyway, so looking at the Earth's atmosphere, contrasting it against uh, the atmosphere of Venus, you can immediately uh, come to know that the Earth is very different. And what is it that is different in the Earth? What is making that difference? The difference is made by life. At the first level, let us say it is photosynthesis of plants that is leading to this uh, kind of an atmosphere. So, uh, and if you go deeper into it, you will realize that it is not only the, uh, the plants and uh, the atmosphere, but uh, the plants are again, so you have the biosphere already when you talk about plants and you have the atmosphere and you have the hydrosphere and you have the lithosphere and there are these sophisticated interactions very similar to what happens in an organism. In an organism, you have the respiratory system, digestive system, nervous system, all of them are working to keep the organism alive. So this is a unique characteristic where all of them kind of harmonize, they work towards a common goal of making that organism survive. So this is what kind of James Lovelock kind of thought that the earth could be considered as a uh, living organism, uh, similar to a living organism. Whether the earth is a living organism actually or not is not the discussion of this uh, talk, but he said that it is very similar to a super organism. Okay? And he called this super organism with all these intricate systems behaving as if they had a common purpose, as if, okay? as if being the operative word. 
Um, and he called it as Gaia, and Gaia is the Greek goddess Earth. Okay, we live in India, so probably, uh, and we already have a similar concept. We have our uh, Bhumata, Bhuma Devi. Okay, so we could equivalently think of it in that way. So um, it's actually a very nice thing to think of it in that way, because if we had to uh, maybe guess what that purpose was, when you talk about an organism, the purpose of an organism is to remain alive, right? Uh, the, all the systems, the digestive, respiratory systems and all that, wh what are they working towards? They are working towards keeping us alive. Uh, so if we were to assign a similar purpose to the earth, uh, I am not saying that there actually is or should be a purpose, uh, but what I am saying is if we were to imagine what that purpose is, it would be to perpetuate life friendly conditions. So that kind of completely uh, changes our outlook towards how we look at the earth. Uh, that, that kind of uh, places into context how our behavior should be to the earth. So our behavior should naturally not be in conflict with these systems because they are beneficial to us, they are what sustain us. So I think implicitly all of us understand that, but this is kind of a, a very, uh, very nice perspective that he has given. That's why I kind of uh, put this slide. And uh, we saw that um, due to various reasons, um, our present development or the way we live uh, on the earth is not sustainable. And uh, Dr. Maya showed us very beautifully how our ecological footprint actually exceeds the earth bio capacity. As I was sitting there, I had a question. Suppose I have a bottle and that has 250 ml of water. I say that somebody drank 500 ml out of it. How is that possible? You are saying you have one earth and you are saying that we are consuming 1.5 earths. How is that possible? Does anybody know? How many thought that there is a contradiction? No one thought that there is a contradiction when only one earth exists and we are consuming 1.5 times? You understood my example? I have a bottle of water. How can I consume one and a half bottles of water? It's not possible. You realize that? But then nobody brought it up that time? You didn't think it was important? I am yeah. telling you, mm -hmm. uh, look, now we have to, we have to uh, very clear perspective about the research. You have one kind of resource which is renewable in nature and new. Another type which is non-renewable in Good. nature. I don't want to go into that detail. So right. this is the perspective with time and the definition of the resources, types of resources, you have to think about it. What she told, she correctly told with a time perspective. Sir, as we consider the earth, we only consider the surface area and all these things. Mm -hmm. If you go for the vertical development, then it may be for the 1.5 to 2.5 like that it will be. No, I am not sure I get that. Sir, one earth is there. Yeah. And we demand for the three. So if we consider only the surface, so one earth is sufficient to live. But when we demand for the three and four and like that 1.5, so we can go for the development in the vertical manner. Okay, it's uh, fine. Uh, I, his, his answer is actually accurate. The non-renewable part, Okay, so the, the, there is part of the resources that get regenerated. So that is the earth's bio capacity. And there are non-renewable resources which over human time scales do not get regenerated. Maybe over uh, geologic time scales they may be regenerated, but that doesn't really benefit us. In geologic time scale, every resource is renewable. Correct. But you have to think about so the our, our time scale, yeah. <laughs> so in that sense it is not renewable and we are, we are using that. So in, in a business it might uh, amount to like an equivalent would be, you know, to spending your capital. Okay, so, um, so these are the various trajectories that we may follow if we go on this way. I'm not saying that those kinds of consumptions are achievable that we may actually get there. Um, probably something may, may collapse even before that. So uh, this actually shows, you know, if we go on just the way we are, we might end up um, consuming nearly three Earth's uh, worth of resources by 2050. But if we take some steps to uh, reduce our consumption, then we may actually go back to what we, where we should be, okay? living within our means. Um, 
So at this point, you know, uh, Dr. Maya mentioned uh, about a, a carbon um, calculator. Similarly, there are there are many websites where uh, you can have like your entire ecological footprint also mapped out. I personally prefer this Excel sheet and this is hyperlinked. You could uh, click that and download, but this makes a very nice assignment. Uh, if we had time in the class and if we had terminals, each person had a computer right now, uh, it would have been very interesting to do. Uh, the reason I like this is uh, this is an Excel, uh, in an Excel form where, uh, you know, everybody can uh, use Excel. Uh, and it, uh, the, the granularity of the information is much better than some of the web-based uh, calculators. So, in other words, here you can actually uh, even, for instance, uh, it will ask you a number of questions uh, about, um, you know, how much food you consume and what shopping you do and things like that. But even within the food, whether you consume vegetables or which vegetables in what quantity and whether you, which food grains and things like that. And you can actually put quantities on that for your entire family. So there is a, a proper assignment for that with the instructions and all that. It will be shared, it will be, we'll put it up on uh, some kind of a platform uh, where you can access it. Detailed instructions will also be there. And you could choose this one or any others, you know, there are web-based uh, calculators also. So whichever, depending on your constraints and your choice. Uh, so I, this makes a, a very good assignment. But what, what I have, the additional thing that I've added uh, to, to this assignment is not merely calculate your ecological footprint. Because what we see here is that we are living beyond our means. How do we get back to living within our means? So uh, you actually, uh, what I tell my students is you, you download two of the same Excel sheet, two copies of the same Excel sheet. And one is your current, you fill out the data in, in one sheet, which is, I, I call it footprint 100. That is 100%. What is your current ecological footprint? You fill out actual values of uh, how many miles you travel and how much food you eat as a family and then divided by the number of members in the family and all that. And this, in the second sheet, you think of aggressive steps to reduce your ecological footprint to 50% of whatever it is. Let us say it is um, 3 hectares. Your, you living as a member of your family, um, your per capita footprint is 3 hectares. How can you reduce it to 1.5? So why is it important to consider you as part of your family? Because um, you know, we are talking to students, so the student will say that I don't drive a car, but your dad drives the car, right? Uh, so for the family, whatever, how many miles he covers is, uh, is distributed among the family members. Okay, so you can uh, write the number of people in your family and the uh, measurement units, whether you want to work with uh, metric or US, you could first choose that. Then the number of people in your household, um, things like that, uh, percentage of food that is eaten in your house and wasted and stuff like that. Uh, you, veggies, potatoes, bread, rice, cereals. It's in pounds because I think dollars. Uh, metric, let's put metric. Okay. Do you observe that this got changed to kgs? So th there is a screen tip over here. So in case you are not aware how much your family consumes, there is some rough estimate that is given over there. So you could use that and again, the, that is probably relevant for uh, America. It may not strictly apply. So you have to use a little bit of discretion. I suggest that the teachers first go through it, calculate it for their own family, uh, do the assignment first before giving it out to your students. So you know where the pitfalls are. There are some places where you can actually, uh, you know, uh, misunderstand and write the wrong value. And then you'll get some really, um, really exorbitant numbers, you know. Anyway, so, so this talks about the food and all. Uh, then you have housing, you know, what is the, what is the area of your house and stuff. Uh, how much energy you use. So th there are subtotals for each, then transportation, so how many miles by car, taxi, and things like that. What are the goods that you purchase? Uh, we are going to see in uh, another topic where uh, the, the goods, consumer goods that you purchase, actually have an impact on the environment because it's only because of your demand that things get manufactured. And when things get manufactured, it means the raw materials have to be extracted. And the waste is also generated because, um, you know, whatever you, uh, you consume after your consumption, you discard. 
Anyway, so uh, you go through all that and uh, this also talks about um, somewhere there is a, okay, so your ecological footprint is zero because I didn't fill anything. But um, okay, let me just fill out something, maybe just something, see. So it immediately, when I fill up the values, obviously 100 was too large a number, that's why it came to 4 hectares. So this is the, this is the sheet. So uh, you first uh, uh, record your present consumption, then uh, think of the steps that you will take to reduce the consumption. I'll give you an example. Um, the student um, comes up with a plan that I'm going to insist that my dad carpools with his friend. Okay, my dad drives to work, uh, but his uh, couple of his colleagues also drive to work in their own separate cars. So I'm going, going to talk to my dad's friends and I'm going to talk to my dad and convince them uh, that they should carpool. So suddenly the miles traveled by car reduce by four, I, I mean uh, get divided by four. Or uh, that, uh, you know, that um, I'm going to uh, convince my family that we do not use the air conditioner. So instead of that, you know, we'll, we'll get a, a cooler, desert cooler. May, may not work in Bombay, but in many places it might actually be quite uh, a good option. Okay, so that was uh, one assignment which, uh, again, we'll, we'll upload the material and then you can go through it. So the summary of, uh, of Dr. Maya's um, discussion and I think from the eco ecological footprint discussion is that we are causing a lot of um, a strain on the environment and which is obvious in terms of all these um, various uh, problems and there is simultaneously a social crisis. We have wars, we have poverty, we have starvation, we have uh, so many other issues uh, that are happening, terrorism and what not. So uh, it, it's kind of, uh, it, um, if you actually get out of it and look at it from without, you will see that uh, these the environmental crisis and the social crisis happen simultaneously. Is it possible that it's not a coincidence? These uh, simultaneous problems, which are social in nature, environmental in nature, but there are lots of commonalities. This common problem that has kind of affected all of us is called as unsustainability. So uh, it, is, it is an indication that the development or the way we live uh, our lives as a society is not going to last forever. We can't continue to live that way forever. Okay? Um, unfortunately, some people even believe that uh, development, which uh, essentially wants all people to survive at the lowest level and probably enjoy some higher comforts and luxuries and prosperity at a slightly higher level, um, has ended up threatening our very existence. So it's a very ironical situation if, and there are some very um, serious issues which could actually threaten existence of uh, even life on earth. For example, the nuclear problem, uh, if there is actually a nuclear war, it would be very, very serious. The ozone depletion problem, you know, it, it's going to affect all life on earth. Fortunately, that is one problem which we have, humanity as a whole has taken very good steps and we might, we might uh, see the end of that problem. Uh, anyway. How many of you have heard of uh, this, uh, this uh, phrase, the tragedy of the commons? Okay, do you mind explaining what, it, I mean, there are some pointers over there, but you could. The common term is actually for the resources which has been free from the nature to all human beings to be used. Mm -hmm. That's like air and water which was free totally. Ultimately, it has been, we feel it free to pollute these two resources and ultimately led to the tragedy of them, okay. means air or water, because of the overusage and the exploitation and the pollution which is being done to that. So Garrett Hardins has uh, written something yes. has, uh, yeah. about it. Thank you, thank you so much. So uh, there's, a, there's an interesting example that he gives, okay, G Garrett Hardin, um, several decades ago has uh, conceived of this idea and where he, he said that the environmental crisis is nothing but a magnified tragedy of the commons. Now what is the tragedy of the commons? He gives an example saying, imagine that we are all villagers, okay, we are 150 villagers and we have a common grassland 
it is the common village resource it does not specifically belong to anybody but everybody can graze their cows on that same grassland and each of us puts one cow on that grassland to begin with okay each of us puts one one cow on that the milk is is the profit that comes out okay the profit is privately enjoyed but when one cow eats the grass the resource gets depleted a little bit right so that depletion of the resource is publicly distributed okay the profit is privately enjoyed the damage or the depletion of the resource is publicly distributed so if when such is the case the uh, and you can there is no regulation on the on the resource there is no no, no tax collected per cow that you uh, graze on that grassland so when such is the case invariably the resource gets depleted because each person is rational he understands some basic economics he understands that if i put two cows instead of one cow my profit doubles now he understands that the grassland gets depleted but baad mein dekha jayega firstly it is a delayed uh, consequence secondly it is distributed among everybody it doesn't specifically hurt me so saying you will keep on adding more and more cows and finally there will be a depletion of the resource which is the tragedy she gave the example of water and um, air and basically all resources that nature provides us they are the commons and they cannot be regulated you can regulate some things but you cannot regulate everything so um, and we understand some basic economics so the uh, tragedy the uh, unsustainability at a global level is uh, almost unavoidable as long as we continue it this way uh so what we need is a different paradigm a different way of looking at development different way of approaching uh, nature and the resources that we take from nature uh, that is called a sustainable development in which you balance uh, economics society and the environment so uh, the within society also we see lots of extremes uh, there is uh, some people so poor and some people so rich um, that the, the, the economic process is actually not able to remove the poverty while some people are already like uh, you know they are living like uh, devatas on earth <laughs> so some people were talking about solutions i was reading through professor sethi's um, question they have not spoken much about uh, solutions one thing was time constraint and uh, i think we will be speaking on uh, solutions in Uh, different chapters like we are going to cover water energy food biodiversity ecology separately and mainly it was due to time constraint and i think uh, dr nikhil also will throw some light on solutions sure so it's not enough to merely rant about the problems you know we we are teachers we have to give some directions to students because if we are clueless about uh, this whole problem students are even more clueless so uh, i think we should shed at least some light uh, on that So what do you all think how do we solve this problem and i'm not specifically talking only about air pollution or of water pollution or one, one such problem i'm talking about that entire unsustainability including the social dimensions the uh, environmental dimensions uh, everything put together this whole problem this whole mess that we are in how do we solve it yes i think i actually we should start from individual level then we can just spread out to these people who are uh, uh, living nearby you for example class i should sensitize my student you do that for uh, sustainable development then according to that i can plan in which last scale i can go about it that is the best uh, best way to start with excellent i i'm sure we are going to do that as teachers you know we are teachers we have ourselves to get convinced first and once we are convinced once we have proper direction um we have to uh, spread the good news spread the message uh, to our students yeah I, i mean that's definitely the approach but do we have a good clear understanding of which direction to go how to how to solve this problem that's actually the the question what you talked about is the practical way to implement yes we will as teachers we can only do that reaching out to students sure 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 as individuals we are citizens and we have to play our part thank you excuse yes. me sir i want to add that we should try to implement indigenous technologies okay. our because if we go, if we see our indigenous technologies they were 
totally linked with environmental conservation practices whether it is, whether it is rain water harvesting system whether it is a watershed management organic farming these all are our indigenous technologies which are linked with sustainable development thank you so much see when we see a problem suddenly our mind is clouded with a billion ideas of how to solve it okay and I have just represented some random ideas and I am sure you could come with much uh, a much better list than what I have over there. Some people think that uh, you know uh, that uh, we need to uh, stop deforestation, plant more trees, uh, clean up the water, the three R's and uh, reduce waste, reduce our consumption. So individual action is very important. Yeah, in, in various topics we will be uh, highlighting what are the steps that individuals, we as citizens, as consumers, as parents, as teachers what we could, can do. Okay, so let me move ahead. There are a number of ideas, okay? And if we put that long list together and if we uh, think that uh, that is actually going to solve the problem, it is going to take us out of this mess, I think we might be missing something. Okay, it, I, I feel it may not work. Pause for a moment, think about it. All those ideas are great. All those ideas will be required. They are necessary but not sufficient. Just take a few moments to think about it. Okay? And there are a couple of reasons, there are two important reasons why they will not be sufficient. A fragmented approach will never lead to sustainability. A fragmented approach will never lead to anything good, I feel. Okay? Maybe, maybe it will lead to some good things, but don't hold me on that. Okay, and the reason as, uh, as Dr. Maya beautifully showed that egg model, I have my own version, uh, I have a square egg model, okay. <laughs> so within the environment is the human society. Within human society, we have different institutions. We have the government, we have our, uh, our culture, our um, uh, families, our economy, everything is within that. And now, in, in the contemporary scenario, we have some problems. We have the water crisis, we have the food crisis, we have the energy crisis and all that. So that, that has some environmental aspects. It kind of overlaps between society and the environment. There are some environmental aspects, there are some social aspects. Okay? But what we are missing is this. You see those arrows there? There are interrelations. Just as we saw within nature, there are interrelations. Within our problems also, there are interrelations. There are interrelations due to two reasons. There are interrelations because the environment itself has interrelations. The water bodies, how did they form? They form due to rain, which is controlled by the hydrologic cycle, which has connections with the atmosphere. It has connections with the solar radiation that is coming. It has connections with the hydrosphere, right? So. Um, there are interrelations in nature, therefore our problems associated with those aspects of nature also have interrelations. Moreover, there is one very important common factor between all social problems and environmental problems. What is that? The human being, man-man problems, okay, that is social problems, man-environment problems, environmental issues. Okay, so man is the common factor. So maybe somebody talked about an attitudinal change. So if you have the wrong attitude, uh, you know, you'll go, go mess with your uh, colleagues in the office, you'll go mess with uh, the guys on the streets and get beaten up uh, and uh, you'll cause environmental damage also. So if there is something wrong in the man, the way he thinks, okay, I, I don't think there's anything very drastically wrong in our physical structure. We are, we are probably good, we are nature's best product, we, we take pride in that. Uh, but I think what we are talking about is attitude. Okay, so if we understand that unsustainability is actually a systemic problem and that uh, it is a fragmented approach will never work, we will also notice that many of the uh, so-called solutions are either too superficial or they do not consider that there are interrelations. So for example, how could you ever imagine solving uh, the food crisis of the country without solving the water crisis? Do you know how much of the water we extract is used for agriculture in this country? Huh? Yes, more than 85%. One report I read, uh, it says 87.5. I don't know if you can be that accurate, but yeah, it's 80 plus percent. So how can the food problem be solved if you do not solve the water problem? If you do not simultaneously solve the energy problem? 
and the population problem and the poverty so how many how many issues are linked so you cannot solve in a sense if it is a systemic problem what i'm what i'm hinting at is that these are probably again let me use the word probably otherwise i will have slippers thrown at me or something like that we are only looking at the symptoms maybe there is a common disease okay i'll just I, i will just say this much and leave it at that because towards the end i'm going to uh, tie that thread again okay so don't don't ask questions about that for now so now with this additional information how do we attain sustainability everybody in the feedback has written give us some solutions give us some solutions what are the so solutions so now i am asking you what are the solutions okay i'll i'll tell you what are non solutions many companies are actually doing what is known as green wash have you seen green wash do you know what is i wash so green wash is uh, green i wash okay they, they are basically cheating they are using advertising it it is all dishonest advertising and they are claiming to be sustainable they will make some minor changes to their process or something like that they increase process efficiency by 5% and they are claiming now we are a sustainable company we are a thermal power plant okay we introduced desulfurization of the uh, gases exhaust gases and now we are a sustainable power making company so what happened to the co2 so you stopped emitting co2 is it so this is green wash you can't make claims like that some people think uh, that uh, if we progress economically everything will magically get solved i, I don't think anybody in this uh, audience is ignorant enough to think that way right? it does not solve things uh, simply pursuing the gdp is not going to help and we just saw that fragmented uh, uh, or disconnected uh, efforts are not going to yield sustainability okay and the uh, example that i i give is an orchestra if uh, you take a bunch of musicians give them different instruments and ask them okay now uh, let's have an orchestra each one plays whatever he wants however he wants what will be the end result everybody will rush out of the room it will be noise right if you have to if you have to generate good music out of that there are some some requirements they must agree to play a common composition at least one person who is the conductor he should have the comprehensive view top to bottom of who when the violin is going to start when the tabla is going to start when it is going to stop what should be the speed when the vocalist will start okay he has to have a comprehensive picture and the musicians should all agree to follow the directions of that one conductor right so then you can have very good music you can have satisfaction of good music so similarly in in uh, sustainable development we require some consensus some agreement there should be some experts who should have a comprehensive picture right but uh, maybe we are getting there it's it's not all there but there are some very good developments that have happened okay what are some of the important developments that we have that our thinkers and our experts have come up with um what they have understood by now is that sustainability must be designed it cannot be an automatic product of disconnected efforts i am going to show you a nice video okay it's about systems thinking okay so uh, I, i think it is pure imagination if you think that uh, we can uh, simply do whatever we want uh, as long as we have uh, good intentions and it should automatically uh, yield sustainability it's not going to happen folks we have to design and um, how can we uh, actually do that let's consider the way we manage our resources and this is a a, a wonderful video uh, right up there the story of stuff we were planning to show it but for want of time uh, it's about 20 minutes i i insist if you could note down the the title of that uh, video the story of stuff there is even a website by that name and it's available on youtube i really insist that you must show it in your class and there is also a video on story of change yeah 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 there are see there is the story of stuff project if you go to their website there is story of stuff there is story of bottled water story of cap and trade story of um, cosmetics uh, there is uh, the story of change which i believe after the story of stuff it is best to show the story of change as she rightly said so that's very nice even the one on cosmetics and all that is is really interesting uh, 
not only for ladies, for, for, for men also. We also use a lot of cosmetics. So uh, what um, Annie Leonard is the, is the person who has actually produced that video. So what she explains is we are running a linear system. On one end, we have resource depletion. On the other end, we have uh, waste accumulation. So this is the, the, the model of how we run our uh, resources of this planet. And obviously, uh, I think it's a common sense uh, understanding that this system cannot last forever because you're going to deplete resources at this end and you're going to create waste and pollution problems at the other end. So this is an, a classic example of an unsustainable system. What we really need to do is to uh, kind of circularize it, okay, cyclize this system into where the, the waste products actually end up being uh, future raw materials. And uh, this, is, this is in the direction of uh, sustainability. Now, um, if we look at our conventional homes, you will see that we, we actually operate a linear system. Okay? On the left hand side, we have various inputs like, uh, I am sorry you can't see it, but this is like your LPG, your cooking gas, electricity, water. It comes in one way, resources from the nature. The reason they are red, these boxes are red, is because they are damaging the environment. The extraction of those resources is damaging the environment. So you have red over here, and on the other side you generate waste. So it's red over there in the other, other side. Okay? So this is how we run our house. But we could run it this way. So if we, people talked about the three R's, so using those three R's we could segregate the waste, we could recycle whatever is recyclable, and this actually is quite an interesting way to, uh, some people have actually uh, conceived of even getting rid of our sewage, you know, through a, a biogas plant. It actually generates fuel for you and then if it is integrated, it, it's not like you only require uh, fuel, you also require uh, milk. So who gives milk? Cows give milk and uh, cows need something to eat uh, and a lot of the vegetable matter from your kitchen is actually good cow food. Uh, so it could go there. So if you have this synthetic approach, rather than disconnected understanding of dairy farming and of water management and of um, solid waste management as, as different isolated entities. If you have a, a connected synthetic approach where you understand the whole thing to be potential parts of a system, you could actually rig up such a system and such things have actually been practiced. Um, if I get an uh, opportunity, uh, I, will, I will show you some beautiful videos of how some people have actually done it. You may say it's easy to run a house that way. How about industry? Uh, these are two videos. I'm not sure how we are placed for time. Uh, but this is really, these are uh, two must-see videos. So I, I'll skip for now, but I'll just tell you uh, in a nutshell what it actually does, OK? Uh, industrial ecology is the overall umbrella. It's a field, which is the overall umbrella under which one of the important uh, kind of things it brings to the table is industrial symbiosis. What is industrial symbiosis? If you look at uh, nature, in nature there is nothing such as waste. I learnt it very early. Uh, when I uh, went to the forest on nature trails, I observed these langurs, uh, those black-faced monkeys. Okay, they uh, they uh, are wasteful eaters. Okay, they eat little, but they drop so much on the floor, on the forest floor, uh, it, I mean, I, I thought as a child, I thought that, you know, my mother scolds me when I, uh, when I uh, you know, drop food on the table and wow, it must be fun to be a monkey. You know, they don't get scolded okay, because even the monkey mothers are doing the same thing. So they are not very, <laughs> they are not very efficient feeders, okay? If I put this problem to uh, this, uh, very educated audience of uh, predominantly engineers, I believe, uh, you will uh, write up a research grant to the government for, uh, I don't know, millions of dollars to do research on how we can make the monkey more efficient. Okay, how to, to redesign the monkey, maybe its fingers, something wrong with its fingers or maybe hand to mouth coordination or something like that. How can we make the monkey more efficient? And uh, you will uh, get uh, lots of grants from the government to do that. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, that's probably not the best way. Uh, nature thought of it very differently. So nature is the master engineer and the master engineer thought of it very differently. Because 
nature had that overall perspective. There was not only the problem of the inefficient feeding of the monkey, but there was also the problem of lack of proper nutrition for other herbivores. Like deer, for instance, the chital deer, spotted deer. Okay? Unfortunately, it cannot climb trees. And so nice tasty fruits and fresh leaves, they are all available up at the top and uh, they are not accessible to the chital during the, uh, the drier months, you know, when the grass is, uh, green grass is not available. So nature thought, there is no problem. The problem does not exist. There is no need to write those grants for millions of dollars, you know. So the waste of one process becomes the food for the other. Make the chital follow the langur. The langurs are, are, are going in the canopy and the chital are following it on the ground. Okay, so it totally blew my mind when I actually saw that. I, I actually saw that in the forest. So it blew my mind. Man, nature is really far ahead of us. Okay, and I already had an interest in engineering and science and all that. I thought I was like, uh, I knew it all and all. But this is, this is really beautiful. And this has been done in industry too. This can be done at, at the level of an industry. So uh, somebody talked about uh, flue gas uh, desulfurization, right? What do you do with that sulfur that you, uh, that you get, okay, out of the flue gases? This is what they did at Kalundborg. Uh, they they put, sent it to the gypsum factory, the cement factory. Okay, they require gypsum. Gypsum is calcium. Calcium? Sulfate. Okay, that's where the sulfur goes. So there is no problem. All you need to do is co-locate the industries. You co-locate different processes, meaning you locate them clo strategically close to each other. You, me you measure their, uh, the resource flows. So the resources we are talking about are not only uh, material streams, but also energy streams. And then we find out how, what is, in, what is the best manner in which they can be coupled. So this was done very, and this is probably the most iconic examples of uh, industrial symbiosis which is functioning and it all started off with the power station. Then they use the fly ash, they use the uh, flue gas um, um, uh, desulfurization for the gypsum and things like that. Okay? And then the waste heat, the, the, the most important thing was the waste heat. Uh, let's say a thermal power plant operates at an efficiency of 30%. 70% of the coal energy goes off as heat. Um, that's almost like a criminal waste, right? So what they thought is, uh, we are burning extra fuel in our homes, it's a cold country. So we are burning extra fuel in our homes to keep ourselves warm, um, that is totally unnecessary. There is so much of waste heat going there. Let us warm water and let us circulate warm water through insulated pipes to the city, the municipal corporation. And they did it. So the overall resource utilization of the coal uh, exceeds maybe 60, 70, 80 percent. Okay. So now, where was your initial efficiency? It was 30%. Now it has suddenly doubled or more than doubled. So when you get a view of the entire system rather than only fragments of it, so the, the re reductionist approach as opposed to the synthetic approach. So when you transition your thinking from one paradigm to another, you can actually get really great solutions which you could not have co conceived before. You would have worked on better efficiency for the thermal power plant, but maybe from 30 percent you will go to 40 percent. Okay? You could not have imagined going to 70 percent. Okay, so this kind of explains that in um, a, a better way. Um, there, is, there are many things that are, that are part of such a process, uh, which is again explained in that video. There is something called as life cycle analysis, which is required for processes and uh, products where uh, from the beginning to the end, to its ultimate disposal, you know, you, uh, you analyze the energy material flows and all that. So I'm going to, there is a small video on that too, but I'm going to skip all that. So these are various stages from raw materials acquisition to disposal and at various stages, what are the raw material inputs, what are the energy inputs, what are the water inputs, and what are the uh, effects or impacts on the environment. When all that is put together, um, coupled with many other uh, methodologies, you can actually uh, develop solutions uh, in this new paradigm. So I said sustainability must be designed so that design should kind of permeate from an overall level to even at the level of one individual product. So instead of um, 
designing a product where if a small part breaks, uh, it has to be discarded. It is, by the way, many products are intentionally designed that way. Okay, read the story of stuff and just note down two words, planned obsolescence and perceived obsolescence. Watch the video and tell me what they mean. Planned obsolescence and perceived obsolescence. If you presently, if you cannot watch the video, there is a, there is a, uh, you can read the transcript. It's available on the website of the story of project. So you can find it out or you can just Google it. It's there on Wikipedia, it's everywhere. Okay, planned obsolescence and perceived obsolescence. So companies actually design products for them to break so that you will buy new products. Okay, and some products which are perfectly fine, but the trend is deliberately changed by using media is deliberately changed so that you should continue buying even when the product is perfectly functional. So instead of designing in this negative manner, we can design in a positive manner whereby things can be designed for disassembly also. They can be disassembled, the parts can go to various different streams for either recycling or reuse, reuse better than recycle, right? Things like that. There are many, many other aspects which I am just skipping and uh, we can think out of the box uh, to evolve very, very nice solutions in agriculture, wonderful solutions are possible. So there are, there are various um, things. So for in the context of waste, water, energy and food, if you integrate these things, you can come up with very unique solutions. I am going to, uh, these are more educational, okay, don't, don't challenge me on the, the practical uh, workability and all that. There are issues, but just, just academically try to understand uh, to, and relate it to the previous concepts, okay. So you have uh, food waste and you have garden waste, your biomass, leaves, grass and all that. You normally compost it uh, and you use the compost for agriculture, you generate food, you think you are doing a great job. Yes, you are doing a great job if you are doing this, okay? Think of this, okay? You don't require only food. If the food waste is fed to the cow, part of the food waste that is cow edible is given to the cow, okay? Uh, the cow's gut is a bioreactor which within 18 hours will convert that food uh, to at least half of the same quantity of milk in 18 hours flat, I don't think there is any other bioreactor available which within 18 hours will convert waste vegetable scraps into milk with maybe a 50% yield or something like that, okay. So you get not only did you, uh, so you got an additional product which is milk, then the cow dung you know is can be uh, put for biogas, cow urine can be used for agriculture thereby agriculture productivity increases. The, the cow in Indian agriculture has been studied and uh, they have found synergistic benefits. The, uh, they used to make these nice uh, bio liquid fertilizers, panchagavya, have you heard of that? Yeah, so many, many such concoctions are available and, and that actually boosts the productivity. You could also integrate it with, the, with a pyrolyzer, so I am not going into the details uh, if energy is your, uh, has a priority. So you, with systems thinking by, by connecting various uh, aspects such as food, water, energy um, and waste management, all of that if you think of it together there are many advantages, okay. I know that as this uh, system gets more and more complex it becomes uh, less and less feasible due to high initial costs and uh, you need um, skilled uh, management. So the, the labor uh, that you require is skilled labor, so it may, may not work out in the long run. but. Definitely. Similarly, for liquid uh, waste uh, uh, treatment, you have uh, your conventional ETPs which consume energy that could be replaced by a, an open wetland uh, with, uh, with the ducks. This has been done by uh, one gentleman, uh, C. Srinivasan, uh, belonging to this organization and uh, a, a, a facility which had electrical bills for their ETP in the, uh, to the tune of lakhs of rupees per month. He converted that into a profit of 3 lakh rupees per month. So a net loss he converted into a profit, okay, because you are not only getting reclaimed water but you are getting eggs as well as, uh, this is my addition by the way, uh, he only has this much, okay, he has a simpler system. Okay, so somebody nicely talked about uh, the need for a business and 
society and many other factors to come together uh, in order for sustainability to happen. It is not only about technology, right? So I am just simply um, make, leaving you with this statement that many simultaneous interventions are necessary. So you need interventions from the side of technology. Many of us are engineers over here or maybe biotechnologists or whatever. So some technology is definitely required, but that is not all. Governmental policy is also very important. E economics is very important. Businesses are very important. So all these factors have to come together. How do they have to come together? Do you remember the orchestra? You have to come together and work harmoniously together like an orchestra. Not simply the businessman does his own thing and uh, the, uh, the uh, technologist does his own uh, different thing and uh, policy makers do their own different thing. It will never lead to sustainability. Um, so we need governance and policies. We need um, uh, businesses. We need strict regulation. The regulatory agencies are very important. Uh, this is a beautiful video on uh, an eco village. Okay, there are uh, small communities, very small communities, maybe the size of a village. Okay, because at, it's only at that small scale that is that it's practically implementable uh, for now. Because the world is headed in a different directions. If you want to do something, you can only do it on a small scale. So people get together. They have common ideas. They have common goals, and they set up a community that generally tries to achieve self-reliance in all our resources. They may have other ways also, uh, like, like the economic process may be slightly different uh, from uh, the, the mainstream. So there is a beautiful uh, eco-village like that called Findhorn um, in uh, Scotland. There is uh, an awesome place in India called Auroville. How many of you have heard of Auroville? Okay. So there people have actually, they have implemented organic farming, uh, uh, afforestation, wasteland remediation, they have done uh, their solid waste management, uh, they are doing uh, uh, livestock rearing, they are doing everything. They even have industries and businesses in, within, on a small, in a small way. So uh, the uh, Auroville is like a, 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 a kind of an, an eco city which has like small communities. Each community may, may have slightly different goals but generally they are uh, harmonious. Okay, so I, I won't show you that video. I'd like you to think of this while you go back. Um, is it possible that there is a common root cause? Is it possible that all these factors which have brought about unsustainability are mere symptoms of some deep underlying cause? Okay, and if that is the case, we need two approaches. The first approach is controlling the symptoms. If you don't control the symptoms, the patient will die because of the symptoms. Okay? You stabilize the patient, but then you have to administer the drug which will actually kill the virus or whatever is the root cause of the disease. So two approaches have to be followed. Um, this is what I am bringing that previous image again, saying that there might be a common root cause and we need to think of that. Uh, as a result of this kind of a thinking that there might be a common root cause, people have developed different ways of questioning our way of living uh, to the extent that we, we try to redefine what we understand by human well-being. Okay? And then you have the happy planet index, quality of life and things like that. Um, the happy planet index is, by the way, the, uh, what they are trying to do is how can you get uh, well-being of a certain level at a minimal environmental cost, at the smallest ecological footprint. So the footprint kind of goes in the denominator. So that's the, that's the beauty of the Happy Planet Index. Anyway, so um, we, if, we, if we go off thinking in that direction, we might even question uh, why uh, each and every want that we have must be satisfied by the indiscriminate use of technology. Is there any specific need for people to grow strawberries in uh, a desert or in a dry place? In dry place, there are other things that grow so nice, like uh, your bear, in Hindi you call bear, Marathi boar, Indian jujube, that grows without, without water. I, I have survived for two days uh, in Sariska Tiger Reserve eating bear. It was winter and we didn't have any food. Uh, the closest food place was seven uh, kilometers. And um, it was extremely cold at, at night. So during the day, we would just uh, gorge on uh, the bear. It was like in the forest, you know, you have like uh, carpets of that. 
so awesome. I mean, I enjoyed those days. I, it was a little uncomfortable in the stomach, surviving only on that, but it was, it was a great experience though. Um, so because there is a fundamental attitudinal change that is required, education becomes fundamentally essential. When we try to search for the root cause, I'm not going into some of my own findings, uh, which maybe it was a personal discovery, may not be uh, a, a great, uh, uh, nothing new, but at least for me it was a great discovery. If we go on searching for that, um, we find that it has something to do with the erosion of values, uh, but I, I would insist that we question even why the erosion of values happened. And uh, it will bring you to a very interesting spot and where you will probably, if you think similar to me, get a, a reinforcement of the fact that education is fundamentally required. Uh, and moreover, holistic education as Professor Patak even mentioned uh, in the uh, morning session. Um, this is an assignment which details uh, I can share with you uh, how we can divide the students into uh, different groups. Uh, first, show them a video about an eco-village, uh, then uh, divide them up into, into teams and say that this team is going to, uh, so this whole group, the whole class, your class, uh, will, uh, is going to design a sustainable living community and this group is in charge of water, that group is in charge of making enough energy available for the community and that uh, group is in charge of transportation and things like that. And, um, how you will understand in that, in the interaction, you will understand how they have to meet and talk with each other. You cannot work in an isolated manner because if you are thinking of something, you, you are bound to cause a problem for the uh, other party. So they have to work together. This can be very easily done on uh, Google Docs. Uh, that is what I use where I can sit at my terminal and I can watch all the, all the groups, uh, you know, uh, inputting data in different sections, different subheadings of the document in real time. Uh, it's really enjoyable to watch them and you can actually uh, chat with them while they are doing it and uh, you can make comments. And uh, they can make comments, you know, if the, if the water group is uh, thinking of drilling too many bore wells, the energy group will suddenly say, guys, just restrict it. We don't have that much energy to pump, okay? So you have them putting comments at each other. So it's really interesting if you can charge them up enough, but you'll have to show them very nice videos and motivate them and all that. And if you do that, uh, this is an interesting, really awesome um, uh, assignment that can be done. And I've tried it, it works great with Google Docs. Otherwise you can do it on paper, uh, but with paper, this group cannot see what that group is working on. So that's a little bit difficult, but they have to walk over to them and, and do it. Okay, so that's all I had. Uh, thank you so much, and I know mine was a little monologous, but um, I, I hope you liked it.